Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth Remembering great ones is easy to do But what if after no days you spent their whole lives Lost at the footballs and catching sack flies Their guys, remember that guy Just gonna remember some guys now. Play action and Manning's gonna heave one. It's oh, it's a flag. Beckham one handed catch. And how in the world? And Brandon Carr was back there. I mean, that is insane. How do you remember that guy? The show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players, past and present. Hey there, folks. One of your hosts, James, and let's see who else we have here that is a fan of everyone throwing touchdown passes to Odell Beckham Jr. Very excited to see number eight in the purple and black launching much more accurate passes to Odell than that one was. Uh, But we digress. We have an incredibly special guest this evening. It is the man that was serving me my breakfast for dinner at that random diner in Philadelphia. When we saw that moment, James, please introduce yourself. I don't know how to respond to this one. I don't remember that guy's name, but he definitely had a he had a big Sal energy. He was at the Penrose Diner while Diaz. I uh, the story that Diaz is alluding to, I will tell us as quickly as I can. We were at the Penrose Diner, a number of us. I was the designated driver for this group of uh, individuals from a frat house who are all in various ways intoxicated, and we got all this delicious food. I was sitting across from Diaz, who was looking up at the very large television behind me, featuring a Cowboys Giants game. And all of a sudden, Diaz has one of the most wide-eyed looks I've ever seen in my entire time knowing him, and says about a game featuring the two teams more than anything in the entire universe. That was the greatest catch I've ever seen. Uh, at which point, we then turn around and see Odell Beckham Jr. make that catch in replays for several minutes. There's something special about seeing those moments without being told, like, hey, this was the greatest catch of all time. Like, to watch that game live and see it happen, I feel like that is just, it's so much better than hearing, like, hey, watch this greatest catch. And then you see it, and you, but you're expecting to see this greatest catch. You're not expecting to see a greatest catch when Eli Manning throws a duck. You're expecting, like, an incompletion, an interception, and then you see that. So I'm, I'm just very happy for Odell. He has a much more competent quarterback now uh, for at least the next season of his career, maybe longer if he chooses to stay a member of the flock down in Baltimore. And, and we are so thrilled to have Xavier as our guest here to discuss this. We were going to get Lamar Jackson's agent as a guest, but of course that wouldn't have worked out, now would it? Love because he ghosted him. me on Twitter when I, tried to, when, I, when I tried to message him. To be fair, he's got a whole lot of people probably hitting him up in the DMs. Yeah, but I did it before he was rich, and it was on your behalf. It was after he signed a multi-million dollar contract with an NFL team. I do appreciate the gesture. If you've ever heard any athlete, that's not money. That, like, like the uh, like the Latrell Spiro. I, 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 like I gotta feed my kids. I gotta feed my kids. Lamar Jackson, in case you were listening to this on Monday and haven't heard the news, did announce within an hour before we started recording this that he is... Signing with the Baltimore Ravens, a five-year extension. I'm very excited. I still don't have anything smart to say about it. So that's all. It's just great. It's a great time. There are some different things making memories for me, though, that I do want to highlight real quick. In the world of baseball, Drew Maggi is a player who made his debut for the Pittsburgh Pirates. We love rookie debuts. Always exciting. Drew Maggi came in to pinch hit for Andrew McCutcheon, someone that was in the Pirates organization the first time, back when Drew Maggi was drafted by the Pirates for signing six other minor league contracts and playing a total of 1,155 minor league games. He has finally made his debut. Love when Oliver gets to do that. I bring up that number because how many players do you think have played 1,155 major league games? Just games that we've seen. I mean, it's yeah. a pretty high threshold. But baseball's been threshold. around for fucking ever. I'm saying active players. Sorry, active players right oh, now active. in the majors. That's so let me just do math in my head. I'll tell I'll give you a hint by telling you who the who has exactly 1,155. Jackie Bradley Jr. 49. I'll say 69. Xavier wins this time. It is 44, starting with Jackie Bradley Jr., finishing with Miguel Cabrera, current leader, uh, by several hundred. 
uh, but drew an entire like great career's worth of minor league games and finally got that one pitch in at bat in which he did strike out. His second strike was a pitch clock violation strike, something that was not even possible the first time he was in the Pittsburgh Pirates organization. And then if you'll bear with me, Safan Hassan is an Ethiopian-born Dutch runner, came to the Netherlands at the age of 15 as a refugee, a several-time international gold medalist at World Cups, World Championships, Olympics, whatever the fuck you want. In long and middle distance running, she's won everything. Uh, That's 1,500, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. That's the most recent gold that she got in the Olympics. 10,000 at 6.2 miles. She said, let's add a 20 to that. And she ran her first ever marathon, the London Marathon, one of the big six ones, wasn't really able to train ahead of time for it because she was fasting due to Ramadan. So had not been training for this marathon. The first she'd ever run was like crying and throwing up ahead of time, nervous that she wasn't going to be able to do this. Didn't tape up her legs properly. Had to stop multiple times to like stretch out her injured hip because she did not tape her legs properly. Almost got hit by a motorcycle trying to get a bottle of water at the end from the table. And she also won her first ever marathon that she ran by a couple seconds over second and third place. Just insane. The levels of grit that that requires, because I'm certainly so I'm going to this. This is actually a good timing for you to bring this up. As the listener hears this, I will have yesterday on Sunday ran the Broad Street Run, which is 10 miles. And I can tell you that right after about seven miles, I become a big fucking baby and I don't want to run anymore. And she did about four times as much. And one. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. It's astounding. Diaz, can I ask you a question? How quickly did you run that Broad Street run yesterday? Oof. So we're we're shooting for a PR, or we were shooting for a PR. So I'm going to say 129.42. Okay. Is the time. That's what we're shooting for. You you beat Eugene and you beat Brooks, so you did good no matter what. James, just just confirm or deny with either trombone or ding. It it will be no. Good. 129.42. I think that's a good goal that I either reached or did not reach. Well, Diaz, that of course made memories for all of us yesterday, but is there anything else that is making memories for you right now? Well, making memories for me tonight as the listener hears this Uh, The Sixers will be starting their second round series, and they've had about a week and a half off in between games. It is the first time, I think, ever in the history of the process that something beyond the Sixers' control has gone their way. Embiid's hurt. It sucks. I wish he wasn't hurt, but it's kind of just a reality that we need to live in that when the playoffs happen, Joel Embiid is going to be hurt. I wish I didn't live here i do live here (laughs) but a lot of optimism around the fact that this if this is a grade one sprain then the 10 days should be enough for him to hopefully come back playing this game tonight i hope he plays and if he does play we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to a player that i've always loved i mean xavier's always loved i there's really nothing bad you can say about trey young If the Celtics had held on to their 12-point lead with four minutes remaining in Game 5, closing out at home, then this series would have started on Saturday. And in all likelihood, I would have said they're probably sitting in bead at that point. But Trey Young, who again is beloved in both Philadelphia and New York, just fucking did what Trey Young does, man. He took stupid shots and they went in. It's, it's like my favorite thing in basketball. Paul George, of course, would have called it a bad shot. Most people who have ever watched basketball would call it a bad shot. But you know it's a good shot? When it goes in the rim. <laughs> the good shots are the ones you make? Those are my favorite kind of shots, baby. The ones that go in. And, like, truthfully, like, I think there's a... I'm not going to say significant because that implies, like, more likely than not. But it is very realistic that the Hawks have won that series by the time you're listening to this and that the Sixers are hosting the Hawks tonight in game one of the Eastern Conference Finals. In fact, cue up that bell, cue up that trombone, James. That's the prediction. 
The Sixers, as you listen to this, are hosting the Hawks in game one. Because the Boston Celtics are frauds, they have zero dog energy, except for Marcus Smart, who is more stupid than he is dog, which therefore cancels it. Hawks won that series. Sixers' redemption tour continues. Game one, Wells Fargo Center tonight. Making I, Let's go Sixers. And let's go Knicks. I know the Knicks are thrilling you right now, Xavier, but are they making memories for you? There's a lot of things making memories for me, but first, I, I just saw a tweet that was rumors about the Ravens trying to trade for DeAndre Hopkins, so I tried to find more about that. Literally one minute ago, Pro Football Talk tweeted, hearing Cardinals are trying to send number three overall and DeAndre Hopkins to the Titans for number 11 pick plus more. So that rumor lasted about 30 seconds in my brain. Can I, can I just say trading for DeAndre Hopkins a year after they just traded away A.J. Brown. That has to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. If they're trading up for three, I assume it means that you know, they're drafting a quarterback and they probably want DeAndre to help whatever rookie quarterback they draft, whether it be Anthony Richardson, C.J. Stroud, or Bill Levis. Yeah, uh-huh. you, you know what would have been great for a young rookie quarterback? The best fucking receiver in football. Are you complaining about the Titans' decision-making at this point? Listen, I get angry at stupid organizational practices, no matter whether or not they benefit my team. And that is a dog shit franchise. Just give us Derrick Henry, okay? Like, you don't deserve (laughs) him. Go back to Houston. Become the Oilers again. Tennessee doesn't deserve a football team. What do we do with the Texans? Did we just kill them? uh, They can become the Texas Texans, and they can kind of just, like, it's a big (laughs) Fucking put them. Play, Play at a random high school every week. The Texas Texans. Come on. With that being said, there are things that are actually making memories for me. Start with the frustrating ones. One, Arsenal losing to Manchester City on Wednesday after having drawn three straight. Probably out of the race now. Unfortunately, you kind of have to be perfect when you're up against a team backed by a nation state with unlimited money. A.K. what Newcastle will be in about five years. That sucks. Rangers blew two nothing lead. Hopefully they can come back now. That's got Aaron Rodgers, so that's fun. And the Knicks won a playoff series for just the second time in 23 years. That makes me happy because the Knicks are terrible. My fandom is is an inverse for how good the team is. So if this team has been awful. I get way more joy from anything good happening. The Jets and the Knicks are the two worst teams that I support. So anything good that happens to them feels extra nice. So I am happy about that. Let's go Knicks. Let's go Jets. This is probably, this might be the only time that all three of our fan bases were simultaneously pretty okay with their quarterback situation for the next season. As a baseline, yes, absolutely. I mean, you and I over the moon, I think, James, Xavier, very happy with the on field, I'm sure. Yeah, I was going to say, sure. I, there I, we go. Only, yeah, that's only fair. counting the athletic performance. Only counting the athletic performance, but we can leave it there. If we leave it there, Xavier, then that leaves us with only one thing forward, and that is your category this week after... Or, no, sorry. That is Diaz's category. Do all Puerto Ricans look the same to you? You two look... It's, it's funny because there's no resemblance whatsoever. People, I just misread people, the spreadsheet. People used to say get our names mixed up all the time in college, despite, again, looking nothing like each other. So, you know, it, this is a fun blast from the past. All, the, all those Zs just look alike. Well, we're remembering that, but there are other things that we have to remember today, Diaz. Right. Well, we have some guys to remember, and these are a, a more difficult category of guy for us to talk about. This week, we're focusing on guys who had all the makings of being a potential goat within their sport. But for one reason or another, whatever it may be, that potential was never realized and uh, these guys were not able to live up fully to the hype and there can be a variety of reasons why that may happen perhaps it's a tragic injury and in the case of my guy philadelphia flyers fans will know that the 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 most tragic career ending in the history of the flyers franchise really the one that kind of ushers in the flyers goalie curse If you're a fan of the Flyers, you know that ever since we won those back-to-back cups with Bernie Perrant, 
the goaltending situation has never really been nailed down. We've had a lot of guys that we thought were going to be the guy. We've talked about Ron Hextall on this podcast. I can list names like Antiro Nitamaki, Brian Boucher, Michael Layton, Ilya Brizgalov. All these goalies were, were supposed to, at one point or another, be the guy to finally hold down that mantle for the Flyers. But they actually did have a guy that fully proved himself to be at the top of his game and capable of being the franchise goalie that the Flyers have been looking for ever since Bernie Perrant. And we're going to take a trip across the pond over to Sweden to get to the birthplace of this guy whose career ended all too tragically soon. Goran Per Erik Lindbergh, better known as Pele Lindbergh. Pele Lindbergh? Like the, the Brazilian, Pele Lindbergh? With two L's, with two L's. Two L's, okay. Yeah, so I mean, so it's funny, Grand Per Eric Lindbergh is just his legal name, but he's really known statistically and like throughout Philadelphia as Pele Lindbergh. But even further to teammates and coaches and within the organization, he was known as Gump. Cannot find any origin for Gump. Don't know where Gump comes from. Forrest Gump didn't come out for about... 15 more years after he made his debut with the Flyers. So it's nothing to do with that. But what I can tell you is Pelle Lindbergh was born May 24th, 1959, over in Stockholm, Stockholm, Sweden. And like many boys from the Nordic Triangulate, he plays hockey. And he's a little undersized for his preferred position. So as a goalie, he's only five feet nine, which is 69 inches tall, which is nice. Nice. Um, and 158 pounds. So he's much smaller in size, but growing up in Sweden, one of his favorite goalies to watch is actually the aforementioned Bernie Perron, who is also a goalie on the shorter side of the scale. Uh, Bernie was only 5'10 and 170 pounds. Pele saw how Bernie was able to play, saw how he's able to occupy so much of the net with quick movements and good reaction speed. And that was really kind of the basis for his, for how he wanted to play goalie. From a young age, he's already proving himself to, to, to be among the elite within Sweden. His youth team in Sweden is Hammerby, and he would make his debut with AIK, which is a, a team in the highest Swedish division based in Stockholm. He would first play for them in the 78-79 season at the age of only 19 years old, making his professional hockey debut. While that was his professional debut, he also has a very decorated international career. He plays for Sweden in the World Juniors in 76 and 77. In 76, across three games, he only allows four goals. In 77, across three games, he only allows three. So demonstrating his prowess on a world stage at a young age. In 78, also at the World Juniors, he would allow only 2.5 goals per game. That combined with the, the kind of skill that he's showing in Sweden, caught the attention of the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, in 79... Bernie Perrant is starting to be on his way out. Bernie Perrant has an issue with one of his eyes. Uh, he's starting to go blind, which is not something you ever want to say about a person whose job is to stop 100 mile an hour pucks. Being able to see is good. Um, it's pretty so important. It's pretty important. So with that being the case, Flyers are looking for their next wonderkind in goal. And with the 35th pick in the 1979 draft, they select Pelle Lindbergh. This made Pele the first European goalie to be selected into the NHL uh, via the entry draft. There have been European players who have come over before, but he is the first goalie to make that trek to the United States to play in the NHL. But first, before he's going to do that, there was a pretty big international hockey tournament played in 1980. Some of you might have heard of it. The Miracle on Ice. Of course, Team USA famously beating Russia en route to the gold medal at Lake Placid in the 1980 Olympics. The Russians went home with the silver that year. Do you know who went home with the bronze? I I'm going to take a guess and say Sweden. I'm also going to activate my pedantic powers and say the Soviet Union. 
the Soviet Union, Russia, look, we could pretend that it was a union of countries and not Russia basically holding all of these nations hostage. Um, <laughs> but yes, the Soviet Union, quote unquote, uh, they were very united in their fear of Russia. But back to the third place championship, which we are such big fans of. Back to the third place championship. But again, it's important to remember the format for these 1980 Olympics was not your true like knockout stages that we see now. Because oh. there was the preliminary round, which was basically just round robin for two different groups of six teams. And USA and Sweden were put into the same group. In the USA-Sweden game within this, uh, it was a tie. It was the only game that USA didn't win in that group stage. It was also the only game that Sweden didn't win in that initial group stage. So on the basis of that, they both advanced to the final round, which is, again, just a round-robin format. There's no elimination. And in that first game, USA finds themselves against Sweden once again, and they tie again. It's a 2-2 game. These are the only two games that Team USA does not win at the 1980 Olympics. Pele Lindbergh is the only goalie at the 1980 Olympics to face down the Miracle on Ice team and not lose. Twice. Gotta feel pretty hot coming into the U.S. on that. It's some good momentum to, to slide on over to America with. He did spend that first year after the 79 draft. He still doesn't come over. He plays one more year in Sweden where he's pretty good. 3.41 goals against across 32 games playing for AIK. And then it's time for him to come over to the States. At first, you know, it's an adjustment period. They don't want to throw him straight to the Wolves. So he plays in the AHL first. He plays for the Flyers minor league affiliate, the Maine Mariners. So I read ahead a tiny bit, and I pulled up the logo of the Maine Mariners because I love seeing AHL logos. And dear listener, I want you to imagine a black capital M with a you know, boat's wheel at the middle, except it looks like a terrifying demonic eye inside of some kind of Lovecraftian creature that has been made by this M. It's frankly a very terrifying sight to behold. It's what it is, is Ed Snyder went to the graphic design person in the Flyers organization at the time and said, hey, you know how our logo looks really cool? Do the same thing with an M. And the graphic he, design intern said, Mr. Snyder, I, I don't think that's... And he said, make it in M. <laughs> and this we is have to thing. maybe see if uh, designers from Nintendo saw this before designing Bongo Bongo for Ocarina of Time. That is frighteningly accurate. It is a haunting red eye right in the heart of that M. Very terrifying. Very terrifying. Uh, but one of the other benefits of him joining the minor league team is uh, he actually has some Swedish compatriots within the, the main organization that are going to help ease him with that transition. Thomas Eriksson is a player for the main Mariners uh, from Sweden originally. And Kevin Cady is the trainer. He's not from Sweden, but he at least speaks Swedish. And this helps Pele to transition over to the American game, give him a little taste of home. Kevin Cady would always remark on his sense of humor. One time, the team was taking their charter flight to their next away destination, and Pele hopped on the speakers and just started speaking in Swedish, making fun of everybody on the team. And obviously, nobody knows what the hell he's saying, except for Thomas Erickson and Kevin Cady, who are just laughing their asses off. He's a very funny guy and kind of quirky in the way that a person who, again, as a profession, wants to stop 100 mile an hour vulcanized rubber pucks. You need to be a little quirky if you want to choose Chooses do to do that. And like enjoys doing it. But all in all, beloved by all his teammates um, at every level. The thing is, the first couple of years, it's a bit of a transition period. The game is, first of all, played on a smaller rank in America versus in Europe, which is an important distinction for people to remember. And also, I mean, let's be real. The skill level is a little bit higher. So he spends uh, that entire first season in the minor leagues, puts up some good numbers, only allows 3.26 goals a game, has a save percentage just under 90%. And the Mariners go on a nice little run in the AHL playoffs that year. They go all the way to the Calder Cup final, where they fall in six games to Adirondack, 
who, funny enough, Adirondack at a later time would be the site of the Adirondack Phantoms, which was a Flyers affiliate, but at that time associated with the Red Wings. It's neither here nor there. He loses in the Calder Cup final that first year. Second year, he's still going to predominantly be in Maine. Numbers more or less the same. Uh, he does get a cup of coffee with the Flyers in that second season. He plays in eight games, uh, goes 2-4-2 two, and two, with a 4-3-8 goals against. But that save percentage, very much in line with what it was down at the minors league. So really all we can ascertain from these numbers is he's still more or less doing just as good. The Flyers are just giving up a lot of shots. Just playing for a bad team. Good goalie, bad team. And I mean, so much of defense is what happens in front of the goalie, but not quite putting up numbers at that point. The next two seasons, he does get to take over as the starting goalie for the Flyers. 82-83. Uh, Across 40 games, he posts a goals allowed average of under three, 298, with an 89.1 save percentage. And this is enough to power the Flyers into the playoffs, where they are unceremoniously swept out of the first round. Pele not doing too hot in that series. They lose all three games. He gives up an average of six goals a game uh, and a save percentage under 80%. The next year... Maybe he is rattled a little bit by this lack of performance in the playoffs. In 36 games, he goes 16, 13, and three. Uh, His goals allowed average goes up to over four. And at one point this season, he is actually sent back down to the AHL uh, to Springfield, which is now at this time the, the Flyers affiliate. Plays in just four games there, wins all four of them. Very quickly, it's like, okay, you're still good. You're still definitely way better than AHL. The Flyers do make it to the playoffs this year. They are, again, swept out in the first round. This time, Pele doesn't even get to start all three games. With a 6.92 goals allowed average across two games played, he was pulled very quickly from both of those two games, uh, only at 26 combined minutes across the two games. That's a pretty brutal showing so far, man. Like, really wilting under pressure after... It, it's surprising because previously... Played very well under pressure, but I guess that was against largely college players. Largely college players. And this could have been a moment where Pele says, you know what? Maybe I don't have it. Maybe I just go back to Sweden. This NHL thing was worth a shot. But he takes this offseason as seriously as he's ever seen. Bernie Perrant is the goalie coach for the Flyers uh, going into this season. And he says, the way that he came back, I've never seen a player improve so much from one year to another. And this really sets the tone for the Flyers season in 1984-85. He's had health issues previously, but this year he finally stays healthy. Appears in 65 games for the Flyers that year. Across those 65, he posts a record of 40 wins and 17 losses with seven ties because they still had ties back then. Post two shutouts along with a 302 goals against average. That save percentage just short of 90% at 89.9. But on the back of this, he does win his first Vezina. In doing so, he becomes the first European ever to win the Vezina. So he's a trailblazer. He's a trendsetter. And this carries over this time into the playoffs. For the first time, Pelle Lindbergh is able to carry over his regular season success into the playoffs. The Flyers enter as the one seed coming out of the Patrick division because that's what they called divisions back then. They were just named. It was a much better time. May I just say, so much better. We should bring it back. And I'm 100% with that. The four seed uh, in the Patrick division that year was the Rangers. Xavier, I'm sorry to say you were swept in the first round that year. I know that crushes your negative seven-year-old self. It is what it is. So they they sweep that 3-0. In the second round, they go right through the Islanders. They take care of the entire city of New York uh, with the 4-1 series victory. They face Quebec in the conference finals. They win 4-2. They advance to the Stanley Cup finals. Unfortunately, if you advance to the Stanley Cup finals in the mid-80s, it meant you were going against Wayne Gretzky and the Edmonton Oilers. This is not going to go well for you. The Flyers actually win game one. 
do they have like an Allen Iverson step over moment? Because this feels like a plucky Philly team going up against the West Coast dominant force. Well, so I wish like I wish it was like a closer game so we could have had like a oh Pele made the the game winning save, but it was just they they won four one. It was like a pretty thorough domination. Game two, Oilers come back, they win three one. And then once it went back to Edmonton, I mean, good luck fucking winning there. Flyers post three goals in each of the three games in Edmonton, but it just gradually gets worse and worse for Pele. He gives up four, he gives up five, and in game five, he gives up eight. And the Oilers not gonna do it. eliminate the Flyers. But to his credit, Wayne Gretzky was even giving quotes during this series, like, Pele is the best goalie we've played against. Granted, like, look, we've beaten that. a lot of goalies, and this is the best goalie that we've beaten yet. It's it's another one of those, like, it's, it, it is a compliment, but, like, it's it's the kind of thing Wayne Gretzky has no problem saying. Very easy to compliment others when you know you're better than them. But coming off of this season, the Flyers are now, obviously, one of the favorites to come out of the East again. One of the favorites to really threaten this Edmonton Oilers team. Uh, And to start the 85-86 season, they're off on a great start again. They are rocking a 10-game winning streak, uh, in fact, as they are about to enter into a regular season matchup against those Edmonton Oilers um, on November 9th. In a a funny bit of circumstance, so Pelle Lindbergh is the starting goalie for the team, but his last game, uh, he played this game on November 9th. We, we know there's something bad coming, so the, the last something. So the game on November 9th, the Flyers are playing the Bruins on a Saturday night, and Pele is going to get the night off. Uh, that's because his backup, Bob Fries, is about to be traded to Los Angeles, but they want to get one last look at him before they agree to this trade. So Bob Fries starts in goal. For the Flyers, the Flyers win this game against the Bruins. And now they have an odd just week off in the middle of the regular season. They beat the Bruins on Saturday. Their next game is the following Saturday against Edmonton. So they have a lot of time off. On the basis of this, the Flyers are rolling. They've just won 10 in a row. It's a Saturday night. They don't have another game for a week. They do what guys do. They're going to party a little bit. They're going to celebrate their early success. They drink at the team facility well into the evening. And this is when Pelle Lindbergh makes the dumbest decision of his life. Pelle Lindbergh with a 0.24 blood alcohol content gets behind the wheel with two other passengers within his car and takes off for home. He goes 80 miles an hour into a brick wall by an elementary school on the way back from Voorhees. And he is still alive on the scene. He is taken to a hospital, but it is very quickly realized that he is brain dead. The doctors do not have any hope for him to recover. So they call his family in Sweden. His father comes over, see his son one last time, and to give the orders to remove him from life support. Pelle Lindbergh passes away at the age of 26 on November 11th, 1985. Some housekeeping before we get to the rest of it. Do not drink and drive. If you had to hear it from this podcast, I hope you would have realized before, but if we can impart anything, it is never worth it to drink and drive. It wasn't worth it in 1985. It definitely isn't worth it now when we have a plethora of resources available at our fingertips to ensure that we safely get home from having fun in whatever ways that we like to have fun. Just be responsible about it. Don't drink and drive. The Flyers were an organization that at the time didn't have a problem in their eyes, but they did have a culture of people drinking, the team drinking a lot after games. And this is, you know, this is before Mothers Against Drunk Driving. This is before there's public outcry against how fucking stupid this is. The Flyers, to their credit, Much like OSHA regulations, they are written in blood, but the Flyers no longer allow players to drink and then drive home. They're going to drink at a team event. Their keys are taken away. And 
all the members of the organization would note, you know, Pele was not a problem drinker. He most nights only had one beer. This was just a night that he happened to have more than that. And we let him drive home and we shouldn't have let him do that. But all it takes is one stupid night. All it takes is one stupid mistake. Don't be stupid. Don't make that stupid mistake. And it is tragic on just so many levels that at the age of 26, going into the prime of his career, because of a stupid decision, Pele Lindbergh's life ended prematurely. The team still had that game to go play in Edmonton on the following Saturday. Uh, They actually win that game. Uh, And it, it always is kind of interesting to me how when a team has a tragedy like this, in almost every time that I ever hear about something like this, they pull together and at least in the short term are able to rally and perform better than perhaps they would have otherwise. I think of the, the D Gordon leadoff homer against uh, whomever the Marlins played. I mean, I don't remember, uh, but in the immediate wake of Jose Fernandez. Right. The D Gordon home run or um, another great example that goes back even further is the Loyola Marymount team after Hank Gathers passed away. Those dudes were all right-handed, and they shot their free throws left-handed the entire NCAA tournament because he was left-handed, and they still went to the Elite Eight. Like when That's stuff ghosts. like that happens. That's ghosts, man. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's stuff like that that you know it, it speaks to just the resiliency of the human spirit to pull together in tough times. The Flyers that season did still go on to get the one seed, actually, but as you can imagine, it's a very emotionally tiring season. They were eliminated in the first round after that. And ever since, the Flyers have been looking for that goalie to, to, to fill in the shoes. Two other notes about Pele Lindbergh that just show the impact that he had on the Flyers organization and continues to have. His number 31 is not retired by the Flyers. However, it has never been issued to another player. And... If it is ever issued to another player again, it will be because there is some kind of massive oversight. For all intents and purposes, his number is retired with the Flyers. The banner just doesn't hang. That's the only difference. It um, seems like a weird choice that they have not done that yet. What is there a reason behind that? Is there any like organizational guilt about it having happened? So nothing publicly available about it. The only thing I can think is that you know they they, they would want it to be done within the good graces of the family. And the family may not feel that great about the organization that enabled their son to get shit faced and kill himself driving a car. Um, it's, it's worth noting, too, in telling this story, like in Sweden, drinking and driving is just like it's unconscionable on a level that it just it didn't even occur to Pelle Lindbergh's father when he came over. Like he asked, like, how did this horrible accident happen to my son? And when they explained it to him, like he couldn't accept it. He couldn't believe it because it's so foreign of a concept to a Swedish national that you would drink and then drive. So I'm completely speculating there if there, if there might be tension between the organization and the family. Speculation. 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 They might love each other. That would just be my completely uninformed and uneducated speculation, uh, which journalistically you're not supposed to do, but we never claim this is a journalistic enterprise, folks. We're just remembering some guys over here. At any rate, they never officially retire his number, but it will never be issued again. Still to this day, the, the Flyers organization will award the Pele Lindbergh Award to the player each year who is most improved within the organization. So the same way that it took Pele a few years over here to adjust to the American game. And once he finally did, he was the best goalie in all of hockey. That has still served as the benchmark for improvement within the Flyers organization. And so still to this day, his legacy lives on through that award. But it's it's really just, I mean, it, it's a fucking shame, man. Like, he, this is like, the only modern equivalent is really like what you already alluded to um, the Jose Fernandez passing away with the Marlins, a young stud in his prime. Making a very, very stupid decision. 
making a very stupid decision and one day he's playing and you see him and the next day he's gone it's tragic but i i think in in tragedies we can always learn and i would hope that the dear listeners at home who have heard the story of Pelle Lindbergh would take away two things first of all through hard work you can improve and you can become the best at your sport and two if you're going to drink don't fucking drive but despite that being the case Pelle Lindbergh uh, his legacy lives on still forever and in a very important part of the Flyers organization and until the Flyers lift that cup again uh, they'll still be looking for a goalie of the quality of Pelle Lindbergh one of the what if guys in the history of the Flyers that is really, I feel like, going to be the the overall theme of of today's episode with all of these deaths is what if. But a true Swedish Titan, Swedish pioneer, Pelle Lindbergh. That's one down. Xavier, this time I promise I'm not mixing you up with Diaz. I do truly want to hear which guy you have brought this week. So I came across this person uh, doing research for a previous episode and I had been hoping that there would be another topic where I could bring them back up. I probably would have ended up just trying to pick a topic to talk about them like I did with Maya Yuzova and that love quadrangle. But thankfully, I think this person fits Diaz's prompt perfectly. So today I want to talk about Maureen Connolly. Maureen Connolly. Okay, this is, I'll let you know, Xavier, we've, we've been worried about if it was maybe the first time we were going to bring the same person prepared. This is not... The person that I have prepared. Was yours so Monica Sellis? I'll never tell. <laughs> okay, there was two. And uh, like it's either Maureen Connolly or Monica Sellis. So I'll talk about Monica Sellis in case she's used in the, in the future. So Maureen Connolly was born September 17th, 1934 in San Diego. Her parents divorced when she was three. And her mother quickly got remarried, but that also didn't last. So she was raised by her mother and her aunt. Her mother wanted her to take up tap dancing, but Maureen didn't like it. So during a dancing tryout that her mother forced her to do, it was so disruptive that she got kicked out and she forced her mother to drop it. Maureen's true love, horses. Fortunately, her single mother could not afford a horse, so Maureen was not able to follow that passion. A couple years later, after watching a local tennis match at the age of nine, she fell in love with tennis, and she started helping out in her local court picking up tennis balls for the coach, Wilbur Folsom, who struggled to bend over because he had a prosthetic leg. In exchange for this help picking up balls, he started giving her lessons, you know, as much as he could do with, again, a prosthetic leg. Green was a natural lefty, but Folsom persuaded her to work on playing with her right hand because he said that, Lefties generally struggled at higher levels, and if she ever wanted to, you know, be good at tennis, she had to become a righty. Despite learning with her non-dominant hand, she took to the game incredibly quickly. By the time she was 11, San Diego sports writer Nelson Fisher dubbed her Little Mo because he compared the power of her forehand and her backhand to the firepower of the USS Missouri battleship, which had been known colloquially as Big Mo. <laughs> At age 13, uh, Maureen switched to a fully professional coach, uh, Eleanor Tennant, who is also known as Teach. Through Teach's tutelage, Maureen continued to improve exponentially, although at the cost of any semblance of a personal life, as Teach forbade Maureen from socializing or even playing with other female tennis players. In 1949, at the age of 14, Maureen won 56 consecutive matches and became the youngest ever girls national champion at the under-18 level. Two years later... Maureen wins the U.S. Open at just 16 years old, the youngest ever winner. One year after that, she leaves America to compete in her first Grand Slam outside the U.S. at Wimbledon. Each instructs her to withdraw because of a shoulder injury that Maureen had been struggling with. Two argue so much that they break off their partnership together. Regardless, without a coach, Maureen wins the title, beating three-time winner Luis Bro in the final. She won her own Wimbledon with blackjack and hookers. She did that. She did do just that. And then a couple months later, she defends her U.S. Open title. So in 1953, she hires a new coach, the Australian Harry Hopman, and decides to try to compete in all four Grand Slams. 
we've talked about this before, but this was the like the pre-open era when only amateurs could compete in the Grand Slams, and a lot of people skipped Australia and France just because travel was very difficult, not a whole lot in it for you. But Maureen decided she wanted to go for it. She started the season by beating Julie Sampson Haywood in the Australian Open final. She then beat Doris Hart in the French Open final. And then beat Doris Hart again in Wimbledon. Then beat Doris Hart for the third straight time in the U.S. Open. Eat your heart out, Doris. She becomes the first woman to complete the Grand Slam. She is still one of only three women to ever achieve the calendar year Grand Slam, along with Margaret Court and Steffi Graf. I'd ask about Serena. Serena has the non-calendar year Grand Slam, where she has won all four in a row, but not in the same calendar year. So technically, some were spread over a couple different years. She skips the Aussie in 1954, then wins the French Open in Wimbledon again. At this point, she's won the last nine Grand Slams she had entered in, 50 consecutive singles matches. Fortunately, two weeks after this third straight Wimbledon, she was horseback riding in San Diego on July 20th, 1954. A passing concrete mixer truck and her horse, Colonel Merry Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure it's feel like an ass in a second. Terrible accident, but Colonel Mary Boy. Yeah, horses have feel like an ass. I, I, I wish humans had names like horses have. Like, just like fucking mad lib that shit and see what comes out. I mean, you could do that for your kid in the future, DS. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how the wild that one goes over. So, a concrete truck frightens the horse, which pins. Finally, between the horse and the truck, she gets thrown into a ditch on the side of the road and suffers a compound fracture to her right fibula. She never plays a competitive match again and announces her retirement in February of 1955 at the age of 20. If I can't play the way I used to, there is no need in playing at all. I mean, it's the fibula. That's the non-weight-bearing one. Come on. Oh, don't worry, you'll hear more in a second. She ends up suing the concrete mixer, and two years later, the Supreme Court of California upholds a $95,000 jury verdict in her favor. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it's about a million dollars in today's money. But, again, because she was an amateur, she never made any money in tennis and had planned on turning pro after the U.S. Open. And the experts at the trial testified that she would make upwards of $75,000 per year after turning pro, this was barely enough to cover one year of what she would have made as a pro, even less when you take out legal fees and medical bills. I read the court case upholding this jury verdict, and the details are pretty wild. The cement mixer driver sees Maureen on her horse and the girl she's riding with, sees them signal for the driver to stop because he's spooking the horses. Instead, he thought it'd be better if he just reduced speed and tried to drive through them. So he'd get away from the horses and make them not scared. He's watching the girl on the right side of the road, Maureen's companion, because he's worried that her horse might go over an embankment. So while he's watching her, the cement mixer swerves to the left, and the mud guard catches Maureen and throws her to the ground. Leg gets lacerated below the knee, muscle torn loose, visible bone, she loses 40% of the blood supply to her right foot. She's taken by ambulance to a hospital where she undergoes emergency surgery and then is in the hospital for weeks afterwards. All because this cement mixer driver refused them telling him to stop and instead thought it'd be smarter if he drove through them. But, I mean, like Diaz said, it is just the fibula, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess. If you, if you don't count the muscles and the severed arteries and all of that stuff. I mean, they're not bones. No, that sounds horrible for her. Yeah, so after this, Maureen ends up focusing elsewhere. He does stay connected to the game by working as the women's sports editor for the San Diego Union newspaper. She started a foundation to help kids get into tennis, for which she was named Dallas Woman of the Year. This foundation is still active with multiple junior tournaments for American and international athletes. Her main focus, though, was her family. 
She married uh, a man named Norman Brinker, a member of the 1952 U.S. Olympic equestrian team, who she had bonded with over horses uh, and had a couple kids. Aside, Norman Brinker might be one of the most interesting men in the world. He joined the Navy, showcased his equestrian skills with the Navy. I didn't know the Navy had horses to do that. Through that, he gets invited to join the Olympic, the Olympic team. Then marries Maureen Connolly, becomes president of Jack in the Box, and makes Jack in the Box like a, a major fast food chain, takes over at Pillsbury and turns Pillsbury into a massive company. And he buys Chili's. He turns Chili's into a multi-billion dollar company from like a very small regional chain and becomes a multi-billionaire. After this, he starts the Susan G. Komen Foundation for Cancer Research and also becomes the president of the U.S. Polo Association. All of those were good, except for one of the things you said, Xavier. Well, it was his second wife. He bankrolled it, but we, we can get into in a second because, fortunately, this second act to Maureen Connolly's life lasted even less time than her first. Because in 1966, he gets diagnosed with ovarian cancer. He underwent multiple intensive surgeries to try and treat it. The cancer spread to her stomach. And on June 4th, 1969, she was admitted to Baylor Hospital in Dallas to remove a stomach tumor. Not particularly nice. Not particularly nice. And unfortunately, she dies three weeks later on June 21st at the age of 34. I, I do want to talk about how Maureen was seen amongst her peers and her play style because it's very fascinating. I, I, I mentioned how, uh, how Teach like, forbade her from interacting with other women. And while it worked to make her really great, locked her up really badly. And so there's a book called We Have Come a Long Way, The Story of Women's Tennis, written by Billie Jean King and Cynthia Starr. And there's a section in there on Maureen. This is a passage from it. Emma Mo fascinated the tennis public. She charmed many with her cuteness, alienated others with her cold demeanor and relentless stream of victories. London Daily Express correspondent called her an efficient clockwork machine and a subdued tennis robot. Nancy Tingay of the London Daily Telegraph wrote, It is perhaps one of the drawbacks of greatness. Miss Connolly's cold efficiency should be regarded as a personal characteristic. Off the court, Miss Connolly is a charming youngster. She is remorseless only when she begins to play. In Maureen's own autobiography, which was released in 1957, which again is wild to think of an autobiography at age 22, she reflected on her tennis career and her on-court intensity, and she claims that was really due to teach. He said, quote, this was no passing dislike, a blazing, virulent, powerful, and consuming hate. I believed I could not win without hatred, and win I must because I was afraid to lose. Green had no friends on the tour because she stepped on the court and literally made everyone think she wanted to murder them. And usually she did tennis, but she made them think she wanted to murder them, like, in real life as well. And... Even if she hadn't gotten that massive injury on horseback, she probably never would have won any other Grand Slams because she was going to turn pro, but she would have been around the game for a much longer time, and we'd probably still, like, people would remember her at least, like, somewhere on the level of Margaret Court, except not a raging homophobe. It, it's, it's really sad that the level of dominance, nine straight Grand Slams that she entered, she won. The only two Grand Slams she ever entered that she didn't win, when she was 14 and 15, the U.S. Open, playing against 25 to 35-year-olds for the most part. I don't know, still, that's, that's two blemishes on the record. All right, still 9 and 2 in, in Grand Slams, I'll still say, is pretty good. To be fair, she's been like recognized in some ways. She was inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame in 1969. Uh, in the nice. International you international women's sports hall of fame in 1987 but it feel it just feels like she would be someone that would they'd bring her out for interviews and stuff today like the, uh, talking about young tennis athletes like even with the injury she hadn't then had cancer i'd expect that they she would have been like still a regular at so many of the of these events it's very sad that like 
career ends for your 20 because of negligent cement mixer driver. Yeah, that that's Maureen Connolly, who is not Monica Zellis. I don't even know who you're talking about there. <laughs> no, Maureen Connolly, that is two different tragedies. You you got us twice, man, with the gut punches. Well done. I was wondering how you could kick an entire category that basically was, unfortunately, up a notch, and you have succeeded. Well played, sir. What about you, James? I'd love to hear what you have to talk about. Well, in that case, I would love to start with a quote, if you don't mind. This is, uh, this is from my guy. I had to learn to be honest with myself. I had to recognize my pain threshold. When I hit the floor, I have to realize it's not as if I broke a bone. Pushing yourself over the barrier is a habit. I know I can do it and try something else crazy. If you want to win the war, you've got to pay the price. That is, I think, a very good summation of the cutthroat world of international volleyball, which is what I would like to discuss today. You had a little mo, Xavier, but we are going to go with the flow that is Flo Hyman who is my guy today, Flo Hyman. I mean... That's a name. We, that certainly is a name. I, I certainly don't have anything intelligent or <laughs> to say about that name. I just so wanted to let this linger for a while and see what you guys said. I do have we were say. in a fraternity where one of the founders' names was Hyman, so, like, we might be so desensitized this is, this is, to, to that. To be fair, this is spelled H-Y-M-A-N. Uh, it is Flo Hyman. Just like Hyman. Yep, and it is uh, Flora Jean Hyman. Flora Jean Hyman is the full name, goes by Flo. She's born in Los Angeles on July 31st, 1954, to parents George and Warren. She's the second of eight children. And growing up, there's one thing you very quickly notice about Flo. Uh, she is tall as hell. She's normally like a full foot taller than all of her peers at any given age as she's grown up. Early on, she's very self-conscious about this, but she learns to kind of lean into it and lean into the athletic opportunities that it presents. Uh, she plays a lot of basketball and track and field early on, things that you benefit from having a large frame with. And then she goes to Morningside High School, one of the two big high schools in Inglewood. There have been a number of hoops legends from there. We got Lisa Leslie, Tina Thompson, Byron Scott, and Stan Love, who is not only a former NBA player, not only the father of Kevin Love, he is also the brother and cousin to most of the Beach Boys. So Flo is still playing basketball at this time, but she is discovering a new passion, and that is volleyball, a sport that has been around since the late 1800s, 1895. It's actually invented 10 years after basketball and just four miles north of basketball at Holyoke, Massachusetts, also in a YMCA. So the two YMCAs here in like central western Massachusetts, just a, a hotbed of athletic innovation at this time, William Morgan is the guy who thinks even at this point, basketball is a little too strenuous for like older people at the YMCA. So he invents volleyball, but rather it's called Mintonet initially because it's short for badminton. And he watches people playing it, sees that they're volleying the ball back and forth and thinks, oh, that's a much better name than Mintonet. I should probably go with that. And so volleyball is born, catches on in US, Canada, 1947. We've got the FIVB, which is the FIFA of volleyball. All of these national governing bodies are getting attention. So in 1964, at the Tokyo Olympics, they finally have the first volleyball competition for both the men and women. One last note on this brief summation of the history of volleyball. My research indicates it has always been an incredibly popular sport with nudists, and that in the 1960s, almost every single nudist colony had a volleyball court. I loved your Freudian slip there. Uh, yeah, you're very happy. 1960s is... Uh... <laughs> They, they were doing that a lot, so, you know. Well, and speaking of sex, Flo is not a volleyball virgin when she gets to high school. She and her older sister, Suzanne, they have played beach volleyball quite a bit growing up in, like, doubles tournaments where they're not really, like, knowing all that much what they're doing. They're just kind of, like, both very athletic, and she's still very, very tall, as so they're just getting by on raw ability. But the good thing about this is beach volleyball is kind of like resistance training for normal volleyball since you're running against the sand. And so she gets very good in high school. She goes to her full height of six foot five. And then uh, she ends up spending first a year at El Camino Community College. This is the alma mater of Suge Knight and also Alan Jardine, who I mentioned only because he's pretty much the only member of the Beach Boys not related to Stan Love. So I have managed to bring up all of the Beach Boys today. And a guy who, you know, if he gets pissed off, he'll hit you with a car. 
that you got that too. And much like Al Jardine and Suge Knight, she does not finish at El Camino. Cool. <laughs> she does eventually get picked up at the University of Houston. She uh, she convert not converts. She transfers to Houston. She converts she's, to a cougar. <laughs> she converts to a cougar, and she's double majoring now in math and PE and playing club volleyball. But she's playing so well that Coach Ruth Nelson just sees her and one like, "Actually, we are going to need you on this team." This is just a very like convenient time for her because since Title IX just passed, she's actually the first female scholarship athlete in University of Houston history. She letters in volleyball all three years. She's an All-American all three years. And Houston is a top five school two of those three years. 1976, she is the recipient of a new award. There's a guy, Tom Broderick, who owns this apparel store. And he teams up with a UCLA administrator and a marketing consultant. And they make the Broderick Award, which is just the top female collegiate athlete in several sports that they award this in. We've mentioned this once before. It is called the Honda Award now. I brought it up when we were talking about Karen Shelton with women's lacrosse. But all this to say that in the 76-77 season, it's the first ever season they award this, which has now been going on for many decades, and she's the very first volleyball recipient of the Broderick slash Honda Award. I do like that, and it also makes me think, you could have, if you could put your name to an award that does not exist, what would you have it be for? I want, does it have to be in sports? It does not have to be in sports, but I was thinking sports, but it, it can be anything. Just an award that you put your name on. I think there should be a best debut every season in all sports. I think every sport, and like debut is just the game. I don't mean rookie of the year. I mean like who came out and just was fucking guns blazing. I would want an award in basketball for the person whose shooting efficiency most outpaces their expected shooting efficiency based on the quality of shot they got. And just the the no-no yes award is basically what I would want to establish. Guy who makes the worst shots that you don't think he should have made. I was so sure you were going to say uh, the Coach's Son Award. You know, the one first in, last out, deceptively quick. You know, you'd let him date your daughter. The real gym rat. You know, you just want to shake his hand. He's cerebral. Cerebral. It's, it, it, the game comes naturally. <laughs> um, he's white. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say it out loud? <laughs> I, we were supposed to just be dog whistling. That's on me. I'm sorry. Well, it's okay. Let's cover up that sound with the beautiful tale of Flo Hyman. As we catch up with her, this is her very last year in college now, after that 76-77 Honda Award win. She says at the time, you know, you can go to school when you're 60. You're only young once, and you can only do this once. The sword of Damocles now hangs above us all. What is this, though? What is she referring? She is referring to going to Colorado Springs, which is in Colorado. This is not like Kansas City. It makes sense where it is. In Colorado, that is where U.S. Women's Volleyball is headquartered. And in 1976, U.S. Women's Volleyball is pretty bad, all in all. It's been around since the 50s. They have exactly one international win, the 1967 Pan American Games. And then they were also the runners-up in the World Championship that year. But other than that, They've never been higher than ninth in the world championship. They've lost in the group stage of the Olympics in 64 and 68. Don't even make it in 72 and 76. Part of that is because for some of 1975, by some I mean three months, they don't have a coach. Their coach gets fired and then they just take three months to hire it without like anyone in charge before they do finally get this Polish-born Israeli volleyball player turned coach, Ari Selinger, and they get the player that they've been waiting for, Flo. She, in particular, sees this failure to qualify in 1976. She sees a lot of really athletic players, but they lack a strong team dynamic. They lack strong leadership, and she thinks she can step in and provide that. This is along with this coach, and at the time, the thing is, like, this is a sport that a lot of people are participating in. It's gotten a huge boost from Title IX, so there's a new influx of just, like, we've got really athletic girls at YMCAs, which are still often where they're being discovered, and we just need to fill these female college athletic ranks. We need to get people moving up into sports because we have to equalize now under the law. It's good that they're being forced to do this, but it means that a lot of like raw athleticism is on this team. Like There's a director of sports medicine at the time who says, volleyball players are the strongest ones out there, but it has not amounted to any success yet. Another guy who is very involved in this, I imagine probably through Ari Selinger, though it's very 
tough to get information on this very weird individual I'm going to mention real quickly. Dr. Gideon Ariel. He had been this shot put and discus guy for Israel again, which is where I think the connection to Selinger is. And then he becomes like a genius that invents variable resistance exercising devices and also gets super granular on intense like biometric data and spin rate of the volleyball or shot put or discus, whatever it is. And like the positioning and defensive, he's doing like volleyball money ball in the seventies. And it's, it's very bizarre how he's like tinkering and talking about all the experiments and running all this data, but it is really helpful for the best spiker on the team, Flo, who is now getting this incredibly refined data that helps her get her serve and spike up to about 110 miles per hour when she whips it out. It's a lot of kilometers an hour. Approximately. No, I don't remember how to do it the other way. I'm sorry. I remember, <laughs> I remember kilometers to miles. I don't know the other way around. Uh, but I mean, even Pele Lindbergh, kind of scared by something moving this fast. And the US team, as such, is starting to improve in the 1978 world championships going into this year they're starting to coalesce they're getting like write-ups in sports illustrated and they arrive at the soviet union the breakdown of this is incredibly bizarre i'm going to describe to you with the example of this particular world championship how it works there is an initial four team pool play in this powerhouse division of pool b the u.s and japan advance out japan is number one u.s is number two then there's a second round of pool play this time it's it is uh, the top twelve go into two sixteen pools, and you get the top four people going to a finals bracket, and then the next four going to the fifth place bracket, and so on and so forth. So that everyone is incredibly ordered in which like ranking that they are at the end of this world championship. Cuba and Japan advance out of the pool H now. That the U.S. is in. U.S. does finish third in that one, and they get to the fifth place bracket. Diaz, if you thought third place championships were great, let me tell you about when the U.S. women go to the 1978 World Championships and win the fifth place championship, their highest finish in a world championship since 1967. Listen, in the, when anybody is ever doing a GOAT list or like a top list, there's like, usually, give me your top five. Give me your top five. USA is in the top five. USA is indeed in the top five this time. They're going to continue to ride this. Now, in 1979, there's no major international tournament. But don't worry. They are incredibly competitive, and they are ready to go to the 1980 Summer Olympics and show their stuff. Uh Uh-oh. Yup, it's the 1980 Summer Olympics once again, and they are not able to compete in Moscow due to the boycott. But that's okay, because we had the 1978 World Championship. We had an off year. We had the Olympics. Now it's time for the 1981 FIVB Volleyball Women's World Cup because volleyball does have a World Cup in addition to a World Championship. I mean, like hockey. It, yeah. There, there, there should be a different... You can have the World Cup and you have the World Championship and then to complete our four-year cycle, I would call it the World Gauntlet and the World Eliminators. I think that's what we should have. I like where volleyball's going. We love where volleyball's going and we love where they are going. In this particular instance, which is to Japan, which at this point is hosting the second of 12 consecutively hosted Volleyball Women's World Cups. China versus Japan is a very good final in this one. And the U.S. versus USSR third place match is less close, we will say. But the U.S. does finish fourth overall in the Women's World Cup. At this point, she is also ranked the top hitter in the tournament and one of the top six in the tournament, which is just the starting lineup size for it. So she's getting some individual recognition in addition to the continued U.S. success. And that brings us to the 1982 World Championship, this time in Peru. They get out of the first pool, again, them in China. And then in the second pool, them in China, once again advance. They have made it to the finals championship this time. So it's not just the fifth place championship. They can actually take a gold medal. Peru, unfortunately for us, is on a heater as the host country. And they go on a remarkable run. They knock out Flo and the rest of the ladies in the semis. We do get redemption. This time, they're the third place champions. They beat Japan 3-1. to one. The bronze medal is only their second ever international medal at this time. Take that, Pikachu. <laughs> now our attention turns to one thing. 
It is the 1984 Olympics, the Los Angeles Olympics. This is like a homecoming for Flo Hyman. She's now 29. She's like the veteran leadership on the team. Uh, she's very much still one of the tallest of the teams. This is at Long Beach Arena. Like, come on. This is just a couple miles away from where she and her sister Suzanne started to apply their trade back in the day. The U.S. This is the first Olympic run since 1968. They start it with a thrashing of West Germany in the first round. This is their first win since 1964, the first year this tournament was ever competed at the Olympics. So 20 years later, they finally get another win. They fall in with a barn burner against Brazil, 3-2, and then a 3-1 win over China. U.S. and China, much like in the World Championships, advance out of this group once again. And the other pool, much like the last World Championships, has Peru and Japan. In the semis, revenge is a dish best served two years cold as the U.S. knocks Peru out this time to advance to the gold medal match. They find themselves against China, who they've already beat once. And the first set is incredibly competitive. China eventually does take that one 16 to 14. And then they do take the next two by a combined score of 30 to 12. So China does sweep the U.S. out in the gold medal match. But the silver medal is their first ever Olympic medal. And uh, for what it's worth, this is at least a huge deal for China. It's their first ever volleyball medal, too. They make multiple movies about this team. So, like, at least it meant something to them. China. It just means more. It's like the SEC. Much like the SEC players, she is now at an end of her amateur run, more or less. It's been eight years. She's 29. She's entering her prime. Much like a lot of W players, in order to really earn any money, she is going to have to go abroad. She goes to Japan, the Japan Volleyball League, to take advantage of this overseas opportunity. She gets a lot of modeling opportunities, too, because she is you know, a tall, beautiful black woman here in Japan. And she gets some acting opportunities. Now, I cannot find information about most of these acting opportunities, but there is exactly one movie I do need to share with you. She films this in 1985. It's called Order of the Black Eagle. It is a B-movie sequel to a film that had not been released yet when the sequel was being filmed. The main character's name is Duncan Jacks, and he has a sidekick, Typhoon the Baboon, who is his pet baboon. And this movie is him killing neo-Nazis after getting together uh, just like crack squad of killing neo-Nazis. And this includes Flo as the knife-wielding assassin named Spike. Listen, any movie whose synopsis contains hunting neo-Nazis, I'm all in. Also, she's the only cast member in this movie with a Wikipedia page. Major you about this a couple weeks ago, I could have found it for you. That's true. I don't know how, like, how the filming worked exactly. I just know that in 1985, she makes this, this filmed appearance in Order of the Black Eagle. It's going to come out a little bit later. But while this is all going on, like she decides, 1986, I'm going to wrap up this season and I'm going to go back to the United States. It's time to get back to the, you know, the national team and that devotion. So she's with the Daiye team. That is the company that owns the volleyball team that she's with. They're playing Hitachi in Matsue City on January 24th, 1986. She's a little winded, so they bring her off to the bench through the game. And she's cheering the team on from the sideline, telling them to fight on, and then she just collapses. They, they take her to the hospital. She is declared dead at 9.36 p.m. that evening. The initial uh, report is just, it's a heart attack. The family wants to get that checked out, so they bring her back to the States, to Culver City, where they give her an autopsy, and it turns out that Flo had had something called Marfan syndrome. This is a congenital heart defect, and it basically gives you a predisposition to weakened parts of your aorta, one of the major vessels. And so when they looked in, they saw that there was a very small aortic tear, or an aortic dissection is the technical term. Size of a small coin just in there, it had torn. It was actually near one that seemed to have scarred over and healed recently. Like, this is a condition that should have made it very hard for her to perform volleyball at an incredibly high level for a very long time. And it was, uh, frankly, like a miracle that she survived this long. Not that this is not something that could be treated, but it just had gone undetected all this time. The one thing, though, that is notable about Marfan syndrome that might have given it away, one of the main symptoms is an increased height in individuals, an increased hand size, and you know that, that height that did kind of propel her to the heights that she reached as an amateur volleyball player was maybe the one giveaway that they could have had to check for this thing that does ultimately end her career and her life. A little bit of good news, the whole family 
gets checked for this. And one other brother also has Marfan syndrome. So he gets preventative surgery for it and is now that is probably going to save his life. Now, a lot of this medical breakdown I got from a, another Sports Illustrated write-up on her, in addition to the ones they had previously with the team. This was published on February 17th, 1986. And that uh, stood out to me because that is the birthday of a departed friend of mine who passed on from an incredibly similar heart defect that basically, much like Marfan syndrome, just causes you at some point to not have it working. And if you didn't know to be on the lookout for it ahead of time, there's nothing you can do about it. But what is frustrating in many senses is that if you do happen to find it, some of the easiest things in the world to deal with. And so it is a, a bummer on many levels that flow like others just didn't have a way to know that this clock was ticking on her. She had, in addition to her sports at the time, become a big women's rights activist working with Geraldine Ferraro and Sally Ride and Coretta Scott King and doing all of this promoting of Title IX legislation and expansion of that. And so there is some recognition of that later on. From 1987 to 2004, the Women's Sports Foundation gave out the Flo Hyman Memorial Award every year to the female athlete deemed to have captured Flo's dignity, spirit, and commitment to excellence more than anyone else. Since 1987, every first week of February, National Girls and Women in Sports Day is held. And this was also initially honor of Flo. Now it's just a larger celebration of all women in sports. And I mean, some of the most important recognition comes once again from our friends at Sports Illustrated. In 1999, when they come through with the top 100 female athletes of the past century, and wouldn't you know it, Flo Hyman is ranked number 69. Incredibly nice. Cannot be denied. It's printed in a paper, so you know it's true. Uh, I do just want to also you know, let everyone know how U.S. Women's Volleyball has been doing, since unfortunately Flo couldn't be a part of it. It does take a little bit of a step back in 1988. You don't make it out of the group stage. But since then, they have never missed the knockout rounds. 1992 and 2016, they get bronze. They got silvers back-to-back in 2008 and 2012. And in Tokyo 2020, 2021, they get the first ever gold medal for the U.S. team, which I'm sure Flo was looking down from above, smiling on. The team and the sport that she loved with all of her heart. Maybe that heart was her downfall. But in our hearts, she will always have a place and perhaps she will find a place in our hall as well. That is my guy for this week, Flo Hyman. No, it's a, it's a great presentation. And it's a shame that, like, I guess she's probably the first athlete to notably have Marfan syndrome. Because, like, I remember, like, a more recent example is um, Isaiah Austin, who came from Baylor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, and in the pre-draft process, it was discovered he had Marfan syndrome. And, you know, they had like that great moment where he got drafted and it was like, oh, well, he'll never be able to play. But to your point, like they have fucking surgeries and shit for this now. Like he plays like he played uh, a couple years in the G League. So it's 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 a shame that. Flo was not able to benefit from some of these advances and these like ways to be able to detect these things ahead of time now. But. Obviously, she has left quite a legacy. And I think, you know, any athlete who's able to com- still compete after that diagnosis now, I think you can draw a direct line back to Flo. And, you know, hopefully her example is uh, one that allows us to not have those things happen again. Well, we've done it, friends. We've gotten through three of the most depressing presentations we've ever done. Pats on the back all around. Kudos. Only one of these, though, can continue to inspire us from within the walls of our hall. Who do we think we're, we're throwing up there? I mean, Diaz, as much as I did with Xavier, I'd like to hear first with your having originated this topic, who early on do you think kind of fills what you were looking for the most? Well, I think if we're looking at pure GOAT status, which is kind of like what I had in mind, like who like was arguably the greatest in their field and like was denied that. I'm not saying that Flo Hyman wasn't a GOAT, Obviously, her recognition continues to this day, but Maureen Connolly was that woman. She was that guy. She was that guy. Yeah, like like that famous viral video from inside the story. You're not that. She was that guy. She was that guy. And to be struck down before she can even 
reap any benefit professionally, I think also elevates her to maybe even a more tragic tier than either of our other nominees. So I'm 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 a slight little mo. I'm a little little mo right now. If I'm being if I'm being honest, maybe even just tiny mo, but some amount of mo. There's a little mo going in that direction. What it's about you, little- James? I mean, I, I mean, flow was a was a great presentation, obviously, and I, and I would assume you're at least a, somewhat partial. I'd I'd be lying if I said I don't want to go with the flow. My argument to so so here's my case against Pele Lindbergh, who I want to clarify. I think is absolutely delightful. I had no idea that he was the like first European to get the Vezina. Did not have any idea he was the first European goalie to be drafted. Would have first off just thought that those things had happened sooner than like the the late seventies, early eighties. But here's here's my case to kind of narrow it down to Little Mo and Miss Flo, and that is the idea of this being the universe randomly taking them away from us because he admittedly entered into an activity that creates a statistical likelihood of bad things happening. Sure, sure. There were no bad decisions were made by Maureen or Flo en route to their unfortunate early exit. Uh, Maureen did ride a horse, and I am terrified of horses. So to me, there is something wrong with riding a horse, particularly one named Colonel Maryboy. Though, real quick, we never got a status on Colonel Maryboy after the accident. Is he okay? I mean, I I assume that he was fine because, like, the way I described the injury was Maureen went to the side and got hit by the mud flap. I don't believe Colonel Maryboy was injured in any way. She rode horses a lot. And this was a cement mixer driver blatantly ignoring their request. Under California law at at the time, as I read in the the court case, they're supposed to listen to pedestrians on horseback when it comes to traffic commands, at least in the 1950s. I am so not surprised that California local laws somehow fight in favor of the people that own horses. Well, I mean, technically it should, right? Because... It like, should. It absolutely should. should. That, just, that just tickles me a little. Like one of these, at, like, has to deal with like a living being that outweighs it by ten times, and at any point could be like, "Hey, fuck you! I outweigh you by like two tons." Versus a vehicle that is completely at the will of the human. I, I say the person with the horse deserves a little leeway. I don't disagree. Uh, yeah, like don't let it here be me caring more about an animal than a human being, or also caring more about cars than anything. But let's not beat a live horse, and let's get back to the subject at hand. True. And I have to admit, like, fixating on the horse here, that fixating on the fact that her first love, even before tennis, ends up being the thing that robs her of, of everything, of tennis, not to mention all of the opportunities that a career based on that tennis career that she'd already had could have provided for her. That it is the horses in the end. I know also the cement mixer. I'm not trying to minimize the cement mixer. But then to some cancer. extent. Just and well, okay, I wasn't even saying up to the cancer, but yes, cancer as well. But to some extent, her deep love of horses was her undo. It's I that is just tragic. That adds to the tragedy very effectively. Where are you at, Xavier? I oh as good as the Pelly Lindbergh story is, I was I was swayed by the actions that were taken by him that led to it. So I I think we can narrow it down. And I I liked I liked the story about Flo. It feels one thing I, I want clarification. Like, what could she have done more after if she did not have Marfan syndrome? Like, what else could she have done that she did not do? Because I, I know you said it was amateur for a while be, because of just the way the volleyball was set up, similar to tennis now. But like, what else could she have done like that she did not do? Because uh, I, so, I mean, she was still she was still eligible to continue to play in professional leagues as long as she wanted. And like a couple have cropped up in the time where she would have continued to be alive in the United States. And the Japan volleyball league lasts for a while. There's a different one there now. There's like multiple volleyball leagues in Japan actually. All of this to say. She's got those, I admit that I was unable to get a clear answer on whether or not she was still going to be eligible for playing for the American team versus just like becoming a coach and specialist for them. Even that being said, I do thoroughly believe that 
given her actions up to this point, she was clearly going to devote her life to the United States women's volleyball team and its efforts, even if that was off the court. So it is as much about them losing this person that while is recognized as one of the best members of that team was just as important for their ability to be a glue guy, something we, we very much like and bring them together and actually get them playing volleyball rather than just being like badass athletes. Okay. Okay. So it was, it was more it's, about it, build, building the program. Uh, yeah, on the court, 29, like not old for a volleyball player, but beyond like she was the oldest member of the team at that time. Gotcha. Okay. okay. I'm torn between Maureen Connolly and, and, and Flo Hyman. I, it sounds like you've got a vote for Mo from Diaz and a vote for Flo from me. So I'm, uh, as always, ready to respect what it comes down to. But Xavier, I think you're the deciding vote this time. You know, just just because of the 10 year gap in being cut down from being able to play the sport sure. they love, sure. I'm, I'm going to take this as literally as possible based on Diaz's prompt. I'm going to go with Mo. I, I think that's perfectly fair. That's, that's a, a, a respectable win, and I am that much closer, once again, to starting out with two wins early on and just going over the rest of the way, baby. <laughs> but that's something to worry about in the future. Right now, we've got some honors to worry about. Diaz, if you would, please. Of course, look, this was a tough topic for, for all of us to present on, uh, and it was a tough discussion. Three worthy nominees, but there can only be one. and. There is no better example that we could offer of a person who had all the talent in the world, had reached heights previously unseen within their individual sport, and to have that all ripped away before she reached her prime. But as her contemporaries and as future players of tennis would all acknowledge, there's one guy who rises above the cream of the crop within women's tennis to be the undisputed would have been goat if she were able to continue with her career. And at least she will forever be acknowledged as the second best. Cause I'm still going to put the babe. I'm still going to put the babe ahead of little Mo. I am so sorry, but the second best to be inducted into our illustrious hall, number one in our hearts, May she look down upon all of the great tennis talent that there is in the world these days and smile. Maureen Catherine Connolly Brinker, a.k.a. Little Mo, with a big spot coming into our Hall of Guy. Welcome, Little Mo. Congratulations a big honor to Little Mo. I also realize this is the second time I've brought a female athlete whose nickname was Little and then their name. After little Mary Decker. And well, and hey, this time it worked. This time it worked because there was no performance enhancing drugs. So, you know, don't sue me, Mary Decker Slaney. <laughs> Would we really put that past the, the dastardly teach? I hope not. That'd be, that'd be terrible. Congrats to, uh, Mo, uh, to Mo Connolly. I promise next you hear from us in a regular episode, we'll make this not a depressing topic. Yes, but as Xavier alluded to there, there will be another bit of a delay until those regular episodes. We've got another vacation, myself and my lovely wife traveling. And during that time, don't worry, we're not going to keep you waiting on anything. We've got two phenomenal guests coming up in the next two weeks that we are thrilled to have discussed some excellent guys with. You can always keep up with our guys of the day, every day, the Twitter. All the info is at bit.ly slash remember that guy, all one word, all lowercase. Thank you to the two of you for joining me and to you, listener, for joining us, as well as our friends, the coders behind producer Craig and Don Ham for our lovely theme music. Anything else on the way out, gentlemen? I hope the Eagles have Bajan Robinson by the time you listen to this. Look at Gershon Yabusele body slamming Dante Exum because it's an insane video. And hey, Lamar Jackson's a raven. And I've been James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as Shakespeare once posited, to guy or not to guy, that is the question. Guy, guy, Whether it's a snowblower to some of the snaps and hands, but I'm just a sport guy. Guy, guy, guy.